Welcome everybody to our meeting uh, tomorrow. Uh, this week is our pleasure uh, to have here Professor uh, Ryan Bubb from NYU Law School in, uh, in New York. Uh, Ryan is a professor of law at the law faculty there and he's also the convener of the law and economics workshops. Um, he specializes in corporate, that's where most of his work is, and uh, he's presenting to us today uh, a working paper which is in this way a form on the party structure of mutual funds. And we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Boris. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, this is joint work with my colleague Emiliana Catan. Uh, and as I'm sure uh, you could tell if you had a chance to look at the paper I circulated, it, uh, it's very much an early stage project. Indeed, uh, this is the very first time either of us has presented this project. Uh, but I think it's right for feedback, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to get your comments and questions. Um, so, uh, Mutual funds play a, an increasingly important role in corporate governance uh, in the United States. So they today hold about a third of uh, public company uh, stock uh, and uh, are under legal duties to vote that stock uh, in the interests of their investors. Uh, and there have been recent changes to corporate law and practice that have elevated the role of the shareholder franchise in U.S. Uh, corporate governance. So one role that shareholder voting plays uh, is in support of shareholders' efforts to superintend corporate management. So a shareholder who's dissatisfied with management can express that displeasure by withholding their vote in an uh, uncontested director election, uh, by voting against management proposals related to executive compensation, uh, and then most consequentially by uh, siding with dissidents in a proxy contest uh, which are increasingly common uh, in the U.S. with the rise of activists, uh, hedge funds. Uh, but in addition to playing this monitoring role, uh, shareholder voting also has a, a legislative function. So each issuer, uh, each public company in the U.S., has a particular cluster of rules uh, that allocate power as between uh, management uh, and shareholders, among other uh, functions. And increasingly, it's shareholders who set the agenda and drive reforms of those rules through uh, shareholder proposals proposing changes to corporate governance. Uh, and that uh, phenomenon of shareholder proposals spurring change to corporate governance played a big role in the shift of large companies from a plurality voting role to a majority voting role. Uh, I'm realizing as I'm saying this, I, uh, that I, I am a very U.S. This is be a very U.S. centric talk. I'm embarrassed by that, but hopefully uh, it won't be too far afield uh, for the group. Um, uh, as well, the, the move away from classified boards has been largely driven by pressure from institutional investors, including pressure manifested through uh, shareholder votes on shareholder proposals and the like. Uh, so, to understand corporate governance, it's critical to understand. Um, shareholder preferences expressed through their voting, and mutual fund preferences uh, in particular. But we don't know much about uh, preferences of institutional investors over corporate governance. At least we don't know much systematic. So the main ambition of the project is to document and map out systematically the structure of shareholder preferences over corporate governance, and specifically mutual fund preferences, although we've got broader ambitions uh, to extend the project. So in particular, we want to uh, investigate the dimensionality of shareholder preferences. So you know, what are the main dimensions on which shareholders vary in their preferences about corporate governance? Uh, we want to understand how uh, mutual funds' preferences are distributed across those dimensions. Are they just sort of spread evenly or are they clustered together? And as the title of the working paper suggests, one of our findings is they're clustered together, much like political parties. Uh, and then, uh, are, is this structure of their preferences stable uh, over time, or the dynamics, uh, the evolution of this? And uh, a second question, once we sort of map out the basic uh, variation that exists in these preferences, is to ask, well, what explains that variation? Uh, and this is a, uh, a tougher nut to crack um, that is, you know, we haven't made a ton of progress on, but I'll show you what we've up with so far. 
In, in part, it's tough because it's not even clear how to think about this theoretically. So I'm a law and economics scholar, so I want to go straight to incentives. Like, what's a good incentive theory to explain why we see the variation we see in shareholder preferences? But the problem is that um, mutual funds and mutual fund managers are, in our view, under very weak incentives to uh, exert effort to become informed and to cast their vote in a meaningful way. So if, given that there's so little incentives, they're so weak, uh, it would be surprising if it's differences in incentives that are, are the main explanatory factor. Um, another possibility related to the weak incentives is that proxy advisors play a crucial role. So in the U.S., most uh, mutual fund families subscribe to the services of one or both of the two leading proxy advisor firms, Institutional Shareholder Services and Glass-Lewis, which I think have European businesses, I think. UK companies also are covered by them. Um, and uh, to a significant extent, uh, some mutual fund families simply outsource their decisions about how to vote to ISS and glass loops effectively. Then a third uh, sort of class of theories um, uh, is that you know, given the weak incentives that uh, the managers are under to uh, become informed, uh, one thing that does is it gives them leeway to uh, vote the shares in accordance with their own personal ideology about corporate governance, their own belief system about the appropriate allocation of power between management and shareholders and so forth. So perhaps there are mutual fund managers uh, who are managerialist in their orientation. They're from the Marty Lipton School of US corporate governance. I'm sure that means something to some of you. Okay? Marty Lipton is the uh, flag bearer for the managerialist school of thought in the United States. Whereas others perhaps went to law school and took a course with Lucian Bebchuk and have a more Bebchukian Barbarians of the Gate style, the shareholders should, should run the joint view. Uh, and we have some ideas for sort of directions to take the project that maybe will unpack this ideology, but I think we're, we're very much in the um, uh, convergent thinking stage, sorry, the divergent thinking stage rather than convergent thinking stage still. So uh, suggestions are very welcome. Now, the third question is so if indeed there is variation in the preferences of mutual funds. There's also variation in the holdings of mutual funds. So together, that's going to induce variation in the preferences of, sh of the shareholder bases of issuers. So there's no reason to think that the shareholder base of Microsoft uh, is going to have the same uh, distribution of preferences about corporate governance as the shareholder base of whatever, Tesla, um, Ford Motor Company. Uh, and you know, to our knowledge, no one has tried to map out issuer level variation in, uh, in shareholder preferences. And so I'm going to show you some initial results on that. Uh, and then finally, um, with these issuer level measures of uh, shareholder preferences, we can ask, uh, a, I think, a, a range of questions uh, in corporate law theory, uh, including a foundational one, which is to what extent are shareholder preferences about corporate governance ultimately reflected in the policy choices and the corporate governance rules that issuers adopt. Uh, you know, to what extent are uh, corporations responsive uh, to, these, to these preferences? Uh, I should have said, please interrupt with questions. Uh, I'll just talk the whole time if you don't interrupt, but I hope you interrupt. Uh, Can I interrupt? Yes, of course, Andy. Uh, so I just want to add a question maybe to your yes, questions please. and anything you can get into all this. Yeah. So um, I'm curious what the ideologies you're measuring from voting have anything to do with portfolio selection choices by the funds. Like if you, so yeah. So we have thought a little bit about that. And um, the one concrete way to pursue that that we've thought of is to compare um, uh, value funds to growth funds. So value funds are mutual funds uh, that buy stocks that are, you know, uh, uh, whose price <coughs> earnings ratios are low um, in, on the theory that they're being underpriced by the market. And growth funds generally buy uh, high PE um, uh, stocks uh, on the belief that their high PE reflects, you know, huge future growth. And you might think that's going to um, result in uh, the manifestation of a different set of preferences in their voting. 
So that our, our psychological theory here, this is a hypothesis, is that you know, if you're a growth fund manager, you believe in corporate management. Yeah, like that's why you're buying this company with these huge growth prospects, you know, this very high valuation. Uh, whereas if you're a value manager, maybe you think, hey, look, there's a reason this company, there may be hidden value here, but we gotta unlock it because uh, uh, it's clearly not been unlocked by the current management. So I think that's a very natural psychology uh, to um, uh, hypothesize, and indeed in our CRISP data set, we have a, like a lipper classification between growth and value, I just haven't put enough the code to, to explore it. Um, so another thought we've had that we've yet to do anything with is, so ultimately we do a, a principal components analysis of the voting data. You can also do a principal components analysis of the portfolio data. And indeed, if you do that, probably what you're going to get is a growth value dimension. Uh, we, I, there's probably literature on that. I don't know it. Um, but at any rate, um, we thought about trying to relate the you know, first two or three dimensions or uh, principal components of the portfolio data matrix uh, to the voting matrix of under regressions. But um, yeah, did you have a more specific psychology in mind, or? Uh, well, I was thinking about the, the decision in the other direction. So if you have okay. if you have a, um, a theory that um, uh, that you know board members' attendance that means is just crucial. That's like your your big your big thing. Yeah. You may actually choose not to hold uh, companies in which the membership, the, the attendance is bad and not to say, well, these guys are just not, they're not doing a good job, I'm not going to hold the, the, that, that uh, company. So the ideology would be affected. So you're sort of, you make two different kinds of choices. Do I hold it or do I, uh, and, and vote against these directors or do I not hold it at all? Yeah, I mean, this is what we mean to suggest with our vice versa uh, bullet point. So, you know, we, uh, like you, Andy, are from the sort of causal inference school of uh, research design. So the natural way to, to investigate the relationship, to, to our minds, to investigate the relationship between shareholder preferences of issuers and the issuer's behavior, is to think in terms of do shareholder preferences cause issuer behavior. Uh, and we have a, a very preliminary cut of this in the paper that was literally done uh, like on Saturday. You know, this is like real-time research, uh, for better or worse. Uh, I think hopefully for better uh, that we're here presenting that, I'm here presenting that. Um, but obviously there's a reverse causality, a reverse causal mechanism that is of interest in its own right. It's not just as a confound to this question, but as a like, you know, uh, how do uh, the views of the management relate to their um, the, the use of measure of back corporate governance relate to their uh, portfolio. So a classic, uh, and this is uh, throughout the social sciences, um, we look for opportunities to invoke the exit voice loyalty uh, paradigm. Yeah. You heard that? Okay, very good. And so a classic view here is that um, uh, when a shareholder's unhappy, the mutual fund manager's unhappy with how things are run, maybe they'll uh, express their view, voice, that's the vote, or maybe they'll exit. Um, but we haven't even begun to investigate that. Um, okay. So Please, John. Yeah, I was going to just follow up actually with the linked question about the set of mutual funds that you're including. In. Yeah. So you're trying to measure preferences, Yes. but you're only, if I understand the paper, capturing those preferences that are expressed on a sufficiently regular basis through voting. Um, so funds that don't vote don't get Absolutely. And so, um, how comfortable are you with the idea that just looking at those funds that vote tells you, you know, anything about the preferences of funds generally? So, uh, for uh, the population of mutual funds, we're quite comfortable. And in particular, as I'll come to, we have um, voting data. Uh, sufficient to place them in our preference base for about 80% of the population by assets of U.S. mutual funds. You know, 80% is pretty good, and it, it's there's no reason to believe that the um, you know, surely there will be some selection in that 80%. That 20% may be not exactly where, you know the 80% may not be perfectly representative of the missing 20%. 
but I doubt it's so hugely different that we're missing a big part of the story. Harder is, um, so mutual funds own about a third of public company stock. There are another two thirds of shareholders out there that we have no information on. Uh, and that's an important margin on the project. So I think that's a real limitation of what we've done so far. It bites us, I think, uh, most sharply on the issuer level uh, inquiry because, um, and I'll show you when we get there, we're only able to characterize the preferences of, on the order of like a quarter of most public companies. Um, but we have a new data source coming online that's going to give us a bunch of public pension funds, which are, gonna, which are for sure going to be systematically different from the mutual funds for sort of the obvious reasons that they're very different beasts, uh, as well as a bunch of insurance companies and other institutional investors. And we've also been toying with the idea that since we actually have the ultimate voting outcomes, so the data we use here is a fund level <coughs> voting data set that gives you for every proposal in the data set what the fund voted, yes or no. Uh, and we also now know the share, how many shares they own. Separately, we have a data set that gives for that proposal the total number of yes votes and the total number of no votes and abstentions and so forth. And so um, we can back out the missing two thirds in the aggregate and play various statistical games to infer what their preferences are on average. And that would go a long way to getting the missing people. Now, we will never get the people that don't vote at all. Um, but for that problem, you know, sort of conceptually, uh, you know, they're not, uh, in terms of sort of what the research question is, um, you know, maybe I'm too narrow-minded about it, but, you know, we want to document uh, the preferences uh, that are expressed through voting, uh, because voting is an important way, the central way that shareholders interact with management. It's not the only way, but it is a central way. Uh, and, uh, you know, it would, if, if we could achieve a uh, satisfactory and systematic account of that, I think there probably be a huge success, even though there are, you know, bathroom fields and so forth that we don't capture. Please, go ahead. Uh, just a tiny one. Uh, you're, you're talking about um, proxy advisors when it comes to uh, the, uh, the, the shaping of uh, the preferences of the mutual funds, but what about activists? I mean, if you're, if you believe in the Bill Senate Gordon story, um, yeah. then you would probably say, well, where it comes to voting, where they actually uh, engage in corporate governance um, interventions, it's probably most of the presence of activists that shapes their preferences because they would interact, they would simply um, tell them why it's uh, wise to vote in this direction or in the other. So I would probably think that this could be a dimension that you should investigate, whether in these proxy comments, for example, that you're looking at, there is a uh, clear structure of which activists are present and which not. Uh, which also might shape their voting behavior totally um, exogenously. Yeah, so the, the, from the, the sort of Gilson Gordon two step, you know, as an NYU professor, I, I really prefer to call it the Kahan and Rock two step. <laughs> Kahan and Rock, my colleagues, years before explaining this uh, phenomenon. Sorry, this is like an NYU comedy <laughs> over here. The Gilson Gordon paper is terrific, uh, it's a very thoughtful synthesis. Uh, so the basic story, just to get everyone on the same page, is the Gilson Gordon story is, look, we've had this reconcentration of ownership. You go back to the Burley means and dispersed ownership produces a collective action problem that makes the vote, the shareholder vote meaningless. It's just sort of a you know, theater, but doesn't have any consequences. We've now had this uh, big shift in the degree of intermediation where ownership has been reconcentrated. So for a lot of large public companies, you can get around one table, a table smaller than this one, representatives from the institutions that hold the majority of the voting stock of the corporation. And that reconcentration might fundamentally change the, the way the uh, principal agent game plays out between corporate management and, uh, and shareholders. In fact, um, what's happened is, on the Gilson Board account, is hedge funds, actually hedge funds, take concentrated positions in particular targets they didn't initiate a proxy contest on, with some agenda to shake up how the company's being run. Um, but their toehold stakes are fairly small. So they might take a 5% position, for example. They don't have the votes to actually uh, implement their business strategy. Rather, they then rely on a second step of the Gilson Gordon or the on and Rock two step, uh, which is the mutual funds. The, 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 the rest of the institutional investors have to decide whether to support management or to vote the, uh, the challengers. 
So, um, so let me actually turn your question on its head and suggest that um, another way to think about that is, suppose you're a real believer in like hedge fund activism as sort of the central new dynamic in US corporate governance. Um, because those activist campaigns cannot be successful without the support of our voters, to understand activism, you've got to understand the preferences of these voters. These are the filters. So I think of these as the more fundamental actors in a sense. I'm, what does it mean more fundamental? These are just as fundamental uh, about that, uh, as understanding the, the activist agendas. Um, we are indeed uh, planning to drill down more on the activist phenomenon in our data. We see a bunch of proxy contests. Our coverage of proxy contests, I'll show you in a table soon, is, is not great. Uh, actually, I don't really know what the population is, but I feel like the population is bigger than what we have. It feels small to me. Um, and I'll point out some fun features of the proxy contest subgroup as, as I go. So the point is well taken. Uh, OK, so right. So how are we going to do this methodologically? So um, the way we're going to do this is uh, by using a, a spatial model of discrete choice. So I could go through the algebra of the way we specify the utility functions, but I think it's actually easier to talk about it uh, geometrically. So imagine there's some uh, uh, policy space. Here's a two-dimensional policy space. And imagine there's some proposal uh, that we can locate in this policy space. So the outcome, if the proposal is voted down, we're going to locate here. And the outcome, if the proposal is voted through, we're going to locate here. Uh, and then imagine we can represent the preferences of a set of voters who are going to vote on that proposal. Uh, in that same space, uh, in the form of an ideal point. So this N represents a voter's ideal point. This is each letter on the diagram is a voter. So this voter's preferred policy outcome is here. And the model of choice is simple. Uh, each uh, voter is going to vote uh, for the outcome that's closest to their ideal. It's that simple. So if you think about that, that induces uh, any given pair of outcomes induces a cutting line that divides the preference space between voters whose ideal point, uh, with ideal points uh, that imply they su uh, support the proposal, these are the yeses, uh, and, uh, and uh, voters who don't support it. Uh, so this line divides the space in this plane uh, that's closer to OY than ON, and that's closer to ON than OY. You sort of think about that in geometry here, it's got to be a a uh, line that bisects the line joining the two outcomes uh, at its midpoint uh, and is perpendicular. But you know, play around with it and you'll realize that that is how it works out. So basically what we're going to do is uh, estimate the locations of mutual funds in such a preference space using a bunch of proposals they voted on. Think of these as like a test instrument. So um, we've given mutual funds 33,000 tests. Well, yes, no questions. Well, then yes. Like, do you support uh, horse Horst Bueller for the board of Oxford University or whatever? Um, and from all those responses on, on all those questions, we're going to estimate the locations of the mutual funds preferences and the locations of these proposals. Now, it's very abstract. I'm going to make it more concrete in a second. So this is an old idea uh, that um, was developed uh, largely in political science uh, to investigate the uh, preferences of legislators in the U.S. Congress, uh, and it's now been taken overseas. Um, so this nominate family of models for estimating the spatial model is the most influential uh, adult computer science. We're actually going to use uh, uh, a different approach um, than the sort of leading model. Uh, it's a linear, a really model-based approach developed by uh, uh, Heckman and Snyder which has a nice feature, which is it essentially boils down to principal components analysis. I knew nothing about principal components analysis until I started this project. This is like my great linear algebra adventure to learn how to pursue this project. Indeed, this slide, I edited it for you guys. You should say, Ryan and Emiliano's great linear algebra adventure, but I felt like that was too informal. So I don't know what your principal components analysis. Um, so again, probably not so helpful to go through the matrix algebra and singular value decomposition, but 
Let me put it this way. So our data matrix Y is uh, uh, the matrix of votes. So if the, imagine your, uh, the, the matrix where the rows are mutual funds and the columns are the proposals those funds voted on. Okay. Uh, so this is a huge matrix. We have uh, 3,000 some odd funds, 30,000 some odd proposals. We're going to have 120 million cells. Massive matrix. Um, and uh, if you wanted to say something, you know, from that matrix about how the funds vary in their preferences, and in a sense, you've got like 33,000 variables to look at, and you're just overwhelmed. It's like, how do you say something systematic looking at 33,000 variables? It, it just doesn't make it's impossible. So, principal components analysis is in essence a data reduction technique, or one interpretation is a data reduction technique, which is we're going to take this huge matrix and reduce it to um, just two columns from 33,000. It'll be the two columns uh, formed by taking uh, linear combinations of the 33,000 variables uh, such that those two columns have maximal variance. Uh, and um, Heckman and Snyder show that that procedure also uh, can be interpreted as an estimate of a spatial model, so why is it this? There we go. Okay, so very good. Skip, skip, skip. So I mean, let's just let me get to um, some pictures. Uh, so give you some eye candy, make this more fun. So our first, our data. So we have mutual fund data from ISS that covers 2010 to 2015, um, and uh, we impose a restriction that to be included in our analysis sample, a proposal has to have at least 20 mutual funds that voted on it, and 8% of those funds have to be in the minority of the proposal. So the reason we apply that kind of a lot side in this filter is, suppose you have a proposal where every mutual fund votes the same way. Well, it's just not informative. Intuitively, it's not informative about the relative preferences of the mutual funds. They all vote the same way. What, what can you learn from it? Um, and so we want to, there to be some sort of minimal amount of disagreement among mutual funds for it to provide useful information. Uh, we also require a uh, for a fund to be included, that it vote on at least 200 proposals. The result is uh, a sample of 33,000 proposals from 3,800 uh, portfolio companies uh, and uh, votes by about 3,600 mutual funds from 311 fund families. So, you know, fund families like Vanguard sponsor lots of individual funds. Our data is at the fund level. But you don't want to lose sight of the fact that funds and a fund family typically vote together. Not, not perfectly, but I'll show, I'll show you some pictures to illustrate that. Okay, uh, so we have this huge data matrix. Uh, what are the proposal types? So here's just the categories of proposal by meeting year. So the vast majority or the majority of proposals are uh, management proposals to elect directors, naturally, because those are required annually in the United States um, at, by every public company. There are multiple such proposals um, each year. Uh, next come management proposals related to compensation. The bulk of these are say on pay votes, advisory votes on executive compensation, which were mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act. And there's a UK say on pay thing. Is this right? Yes, very good. All right. Started here in 2002. Very good. All right, you guys are ahead of us on that. Uh, and then there are also a set of shareholder proposals. So the prefix FPSV, this is whether it's a management proposal or a shareholder proposal. Um, and uh, most significant are the shareholder proposals related to corporate governance. Um, so just wait a minute. Yes. The elect directors probably are about 90%, 95% of uh, the voting outcomes that you have in your sample? It's about <coughs> two thirds. It's about two thirds. So it's 21,000 out of. 33,000. Does that okay. potentially sort of skew the analysis or tilt the analysis? Because this is a very specific, one dimensional question. Um, what can you derive from the answers to that particular question with respect to shareholder preferences in general, basically? Yeah, we've thought about that. It's a, it's a bit of a puzzle. And um, one reason why we've chosen to lump everything together in one sample is part of the idea of the project is that um, 
how a fund votes on director elections and how they vote on, say, a show proposal by corporate governance, uh, in fact, may have a relationship with one another. We don't want to assume there's not a relationship. And indeed, uh, there is a relationship, which we'll show you. Um, and so, in essence, we think of these preferences as some latent view of things. Um, and we are using these proposals, think of it as almost like a test. You have a bunch of school children, and you want to learn about some latent set of abilities or latent views, and you give them a bunch of tests. You have a math test, you give a science test, you have a physics test, and so forth, uh, to measure some underlying trait uh, or preference uh, uh, or ability. And so, um, I know this is rather abstract, but we think of these uh, director elections as sussing out a common latent feature of preference uh, uh, to what the social, uh, shareholder proposals on uh, corporate social responsibility do. Now, all that said, we actually have played games with cutting the sample. Mm -hmm. And you, you recover the same first and second dimensions. Mm -hmm. So if you look just at director election, we actually started there. So mm -hmm. you, you get the same mm -hmm. basic dimensions. Not exactly the same, but very, very similar. Okay. Um, and then this is just further breaking down the shareholder proposals on corporate governance. So the biggest, most numerous uh, type are shareholder proposals asking uh, for the appointment of the lead and the director and the chairman of the board. Um, all right. So we get a bunch of data from Chris on, uh, on uh, mutual fund characteristics. Uh, and just to give you a sense, you know, 17% of our sample of funds that we estimate preferences for are index funds. The balance are various forms of actively managed funds. Um, uh, and so on and so forth. So the average fund is in a family with 115 funds. Um, <clears throat> okay. Excuse me. Please. Be saying that uh, what you focus more on are the corporate governance proposals. Uh, did, did I understand correctly that you place a particular weight on those? <laughs> so, in the empirical analysis, every proposal is equivalent, uh, and we don't. Uh, the estimation of shareholder pre of mutual fund preferences uh, includes no uh, e uh, external information about what they're voting on whatsoever. It's just that, that vote matrix I described with no labels. And we're going to go and figure out the spatial map of preference from that vote matrix. So it's very data driven. Substantively, we are interested in shareholder proposals on corporate governance <coughs> because of the role they play in corporate governance. Um, so that's a sense in which I'm going to uh, think harder about this class than the management proposals to ratify auditors, which we're shocked is even in the sample, right? So, these are not exciting proposals. If you think about like one of the most exciting proposals, it's probably not the proposal to ratify the firm's auditors. Okay, it doesn't get my blood going. Okay, um, we're shocked they're even in the sample. You would think our lopsidedness threshold would have kicked those out because when is there a controversy? Turns out there's controversy. There's a fun. There's like Glass Lewis is the story. Glass Lewis recommends against a lot of these for various reasons, which I didn't even know about. Um, Okay, please jump. So, um, just a couple of questions about the principal component. Now. Yes, yes, yes. Understand what's going on there. Firstly, are you assuming that the, the funds have constant preferences over time in this period? Uh, we are. And secondly, are you assuming that they have um, kind of equivalent interest in each of the possible things that get voted on? Because um, it, it seems to me that you could have some funds that care a lot about some of these things but not about others and therefore their their preferences are going to be driving the results in uh, those you know, the subset of issues. Is that something that the PCA is going to kind of use or is that something that's going to work against? <coughs> so, um, so the principle of analysis it really is only using that vote matrix I described and so all that's in it, so each cell is defined by a fund proposal combination, and there are only three things that can be in the cell, a one, a zero, or a missing. So there's, um, so in your thought is that 
Right, there are some proposals that funds care more about than others. Surely that's right. Um, but that doesn't play any explicit role in our analysis. And I'd have to think more about um, how that would play out. So one possibility uh, uh, might be something like, for a lot of the proposals, you know, funds don't really care, and so they just kind of vote randomly, something like this. But the ones they really care about, they're going to dig in and learn about the details and then make a considered choice because they care more about it. That seems totally intuitive to me. Um, and uh, the you know random votes uh, will just show up as noise. So because they're random, the principal components won't extract them. They'll just not play a role in our first two components. Um, but that's my off-the-cuff knee-jerk reaction. It's a good question I want to think more about. Okay. Um, so let me just show you. Uh, Sorry, what? Just a follow up question. Of course, yes. So, so there are quite a lot of assumptions embedded in what, what you're doing, as, as we've just been talking about. So, you know, the assumption that people will vote the same way over time and so on. I mean, do you plan to test any of these assumptions by trying to sort of, you know, have meetings or to sort of do any sort of interviews with any of these particular <coughs> funds in order to test those assumptions in any way? Yeah, so um, on the stability part of the evolution over time, so we have actually investigated that uh, quantitatively. It, we just didn't make the draft by the deadline. I would have to send you, you guys something. Uh, I'm sorry, rather late. Uh, and so we have, I should have said this, John, so forgive me. Um, we have estimated our model uh, separately for cohorts of samples, uh, cohorts of proposals. And so I think our favorite version of the dynamic one is. Uh, two year cohorts, so 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. Uh, and things are remarkably stable. The dimensionality is the same over time. You know, if you cross your eyes, you can see BlackRock moving, but it's not really clear it's a real phenomenon. Um, so the, I think the overarching message on the uh, dynamics is, is one of stability, uh, which is the main reason why, you know, all of our we just assume it's the same and pull it all together because you get a lot more power that way. You can just do more things with a, a full sample, and we didn't feel like there was much going on over time. Um, so, uh, one key uh, issue with a, estimating a spatial model through principal components or otherwise is how many dimensions of that space to use. Like, there's no obvious a priori answer to this. You can have a one dimensional model, right? Uh, so, the U.S. Congress, turns out, <coughs> FYI, is largely one-dimensional, and what is the dimension? It's Republican, Democrat. Shocker, I know, you guys can't believe that's real, but, you know, people like Annie get paid the big bucks for telling us stuff like that with David, okay? Turns out that's the major conflict in, in Congress. I'm giving you a hard time, Andy. You get big bucks. What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, but here, maybe it's not one-dimensional. It's not even clear what the dimensions are. Um, we have to make a choice. It could be four dimensions. It could be one dimension. It could be two dimensions. So a classic way of de dealing with that is by looking at the eigenvalues of each of the principal points. I'm sorry this is turning into such a major algebra talk, but um, these just are the, a measure. This is just the variance of the first principal component. This is the variance of the second principal component, and so forth. And there's a rule of thumb that um, you stop when things get linear in the eigenvalues. And, uh, and the idea here is that at some point you're, you're just fitting the noise. And this, uh, this shape by the people who you know, have, are trained in the dark arts of interpreting principal components tell us that when you get this linear, characteristic linear thing, you're just fitting the noise and these aren't real. Um, please. Um, this actually relates to Jenny's question that. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> just, uh, I was wondering, there's, there's kind of an additional alternative for the farmers to Vault, which is actually exit. Uh, yes. The investment of selling the stock. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I was just wondering whether it's even possible to track that against with you know the biggest decision might be to make a real thought. Just if they oppose a particular way of uh, deciding on things. So, what's your view? Is it, is it possible to kind of check that against what the funds have actually <coughs> done in their portfolio allocation? Uh, if they don't like what's going on in the corporate government. Yeah, so I, we have 
this possibility has occurred to us, but we haven't spent any serious time thinking about it, and we should, because it's, I think it's super interesting, it's an interesting question. So we need to think about how to operationalize, investigating that in our framework, or without our, in some other framework, but just off the cuff, uh, so you know, we're gonna be able to place funds in a space, yeah? And we can also place proposals uh, in a space. And so here would be a way to come up with a measure of a preference-based measure of funds dislike for a particular issuer. And that would be to take some average of the, of the cutting lines of the director elections of that issuer and uh, look at funds that are sort of extreme in terms of not liking uh, that, that set of proposals. Uh, and see if they uh, select down by exit. So anyways, I don't think that, would, I, I now realize there are problems with what I just said, but something like this might fly, so we just haven't, haven't thought about it enough about it. Um, okay, so based on this screen plot, we're gonna use a two-dimensional model. We, we try to interpret the third dimension, and it just looks like it loads on like random proposals. We can come up with any story behind it, and so it just wasn't very interesting. And with a two-dimensional model, we can, ex we can correctly predict, our model will correctly classify 87% of the votes in the, in the sample, which is not bad. And remember, these are conditional, there being some controversy. So um, you know, all of the like 99% votes are not in the sample. Uh, indeed, our average proportional reduction error is about 50%. So this is how well the model's doing uh, over and above the model that <coughs> just predicted with the majority of voter needs um, which is a way of sort of normalizing for the average support. But um, let me show you some pictures, okay? This is, this is going to make it all worth it, I hope. So here it is. This is our paper. This is like basically our paper with this picture. Um, so what is this picture? So each dot is a mutual fund. You know, there are 3,300 3, 3, dots, yeah? And uh, this is their preference measure in the two dimensions, dimension one and dimension two. We've also plotted here with colored triangles uh, the average preference of funds in particular families, and they weren't chosen. They were chosen because they're like noteworthy families. So BlackRock is the single biggest uh, institutional investor, so it made sense to like put them on the plot. Vanguard, another big one. State Street, these are the big three passive managers. Fidelity and T. Rowe Price are important active management. I mean, they have some index funds too, but they have more active management fund families. Um, Charles Schwab is another big one with a lot of indexing. Uh, Columbia is another big active manager. Uh, we also are able to estimate the locations of three other actors. In addition to the 3,300 some odd funds, uh, we can place institutional shareholder services, corporate management, and Glass Lewis in the space. So, how do we do that? So, each of these three actors makes recommendations on each proposal. So they just get added as a row in the vote matrix with their recommendations representing their vote. And that doesn't affect, you know, there are three out of 3,300 rows, so it doesn't really affect the estimate. You can drop them and you get the same picture. But it lets us locate them in the same space, which gives us some interpretation of what the main two dimensions of mutual fund preference are. So it turns out, so just looking at the locations, note, management in the lower left, uh, low on both dimensions, Glass Lewis, high on dimension two, low on dimension one. Institutional shareholder services, high on dimension one, low on dimension two. And that's the basic interpretation. I'll well, show you some more results. So, um, so there's a lot of variation um, in preference, and it's along these two basic dimensions. So the, we don't know whether, as yet, whether institutional shareholder services and Glass Lewis kind of cause this structure through the recommendation. So that would be the case if the model here is one where this big cluster of funds, you see how dark this is, yeah, it's lots of funds here, a big pile of them. Whether they simply uh, outsource their decision making to ISS, that's a plausible model actually, we don't know it's the case from this picture. It could be instead that this group of funds has some conception of corporate governance and ISS simply reflects that conception. We don't know. Both are consistent with the basic pattern, yeah? This is another margin where we want to uh, drill down more in the paper. Um, so this is the same basic plot, but I'm going to put some new things on it. So 
What I've done here is I took away the families, the family averages, and instead for each of those families that I plotted the average of in the previous plot, I colored and labeled their funds to give you some sense of the dispersion of preference within family. So, you know, this sickly green color, um, that's Columbia funds. Um, and you see that they're not like scattered all over the map, right? This is the Columbia funds viewpoint. Uh, Vanguard is in pink here. BlackRock is here. There are a few families that are quite dispersed, and Fidelity is one of them. So this forest green um, is also the same uh, family over here. This is also Fidelity, 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 Fidelity. You see it's more scattered. Um, I don't know what these three BlackRock funds are doing over here. These are BlackRock funds. Uh, it's not <coughs> uh, I wonder what the story there is. Um, okay. Um, so what does this model do? So let me give you a fun, a fun example of what this model does. Okay, so here is, recall that little conceptual diagram I had shown before of like how a spatial model works. Here is, a, uh, here is one of those diagrams for one of our actual votes in the data. This is one column in the vote matrix. This was a proposal at Wells Fargo uh, and Company uh, in their 2010 annual meeting, uh, a shareholder proposed that the board appoint an independent chairman. And uh, management opposed that. ISS supported it, and we actually don't have data for this proposal on what class those are in. Our, our class those data is incomplete for reasons I won't bore you with. Um, and here, with N's and Y's, are plotted the votes of each fund that voted on it, uh, located at their estimated preference location. Yeah? And you just you know stare at this for a little while, okay? Um, and you'll see there's an obvious pattern. <coughs> These are ends, yeah. Lots and lots of ends. Uh, where are the Y's? The Y's are largely over here, uh, uh, around ISS and sort of this way. So sorry, they're colors. So some of these are bold and red, and then some of them are just like boring gray. So the bold and red are the ones we predict wrong. Should have said that. So the letters are how they actually voted, yeah? Uh, and the ones that are bold and red are ones where the model predicted they should vote the other way, yeah? And you can see that the, the model has the most trouble kind of in the middle, which makes sense. Because you know the cutting line, if you're thinking about that spatial model, I, I haven't figured out a way to plot, I need to figure out a way to plot the cutting lines and extract the cutting line intercept and slope from our principal components <coughs> and outputs, which I haven't done yet, it's on my to-do list. But you can tell the cutting line, you just look at where, uh, so this is a red N and this is a red Y, meaning that the prediction flipped between them. The cutting line is like here, yeah? So, you know, this, I, I find looking at these things just kind of fascinating to see the structure of mutual fund preference. Uh, ah, uh, activist uh, event here. So, in activism, this is Nelson Pelt's attempt to shake up the board of DuPont from 2015, ultimately unsuccessful. So uh, this is the, a proposal to elect one of his nominees. And the model does less well on this. Uh, so the classification percentage here is 78% versus the classification percentage in, wow, well, it's not that much better, 80% in the previous one. Uh, and again, management, of course, opposed, ISS supported, uh, and you see this group around ISS's location is mostly yeses, and the model predicts yeses. The model predicts yeses all the way through into here, and only starts predicting no's down here, so our estimated cut line is all the way over here. Uh, and this group that's sort of located around management is divided. This gets back to this point about, you know, they're the deciders ultimately. Um, and actually, more book plots, but uh, John. So, um, this is a, a sort of a, um, a, a reprise of my earlier question. Please, 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 please. A little bit more um, carefully now. Yeah. And in your matrix of data, yeah. um, most of the cells are empty because, in most cases, they don't vote. Correct. Um, does, do those missing values, are they excluded from the principal component analysis? Um, or does the fact that they didn't vote, does that go into the analysis? Because if it's the latter, uh, sorry, if it's the former, if they're excluded, then it, it will be very interesting to see what the 
party structure, if you will, or the, the, the fund family structure of whether you vote or not looks like, uh, which you could do by just doing another matrix where you have zero, one for vote or not. Um, so the reason these things are empty, so uh, 90, almost 96% of the cells are empty. The vast majority are empty. The reason a cell is empty is almost always because that fund simply doesn't hold uh, stock in the issuer. I see. So it's, uh, I mean, this gets back to sort of the exit stuff as yeah. opposed to yeah. like the exactly. word of staining. Yeah. And the reason for that, the reason that funds in fact vote when they own the stock um, is a set of regulations uh, of uh, investment companies that are actually kind of subtle and complicated. Um, and technically do not require them to vote, but rather they have language that varies whether it's uh, regular than ERISA because it's held in a retirement account or not. Uh, but the basic uh, legal norm is that the um, uh, investment advisor and the director of the fund have a legal obligation to exercise their voting rights or not uh, with the, the interests of their investors in mind. The way that's in fact played out in practice is ever since the SEC required funds to disclose how they vote, which is how we get the data ultimately, which was in 2004, 2005, um, user funds essentially always vote. If they uh, hold the stock and there's a proposal, they vote on the thing. Not 100%, but it's 99.99%. Um, right, but the missing data poses a major challenge to estimating this model. And if there's anything sort of innovative methodologically about the paper, you know, in the large part of this paper, methodologically involves, there are a bunch of tools that were developed to, in political science to study political voting. And we say, well, look, we can use these tools to like, uh, and so to open a window into mutual fund voting. Um, but it turns out we have a lot more missing data in our vote matrix than you would in like a roll call from Congress. So like most members of Congress vote on almost all the roll calls. Is it the same in the parliament? I don't know. Um, and so there's not much missing data in the political version of this, whereas we have 95% missing. And so we have to do, we have to adopt some uh, techniques that were developed in machine learning uh, to uh, iterate, to impute the missing data. But it's, there are results in the machine learning literature that show that um, when you converge, um, you are minimizing the prediction errors only for the observed data, so the missing data ends up not mattering. Uh, so really, this is an artificial intelligence paper. I should brand it that way. You know, it's basically like my next project is to create a self-driving car, but this is the first, this is the first step toward that, okay? Um, but, but just with those, miss, with those missing, so, so one reason yes. one reason they don't vote is they never help. The other reason is that they're strategically diverse. Um, Correct. Because they don't know what's going on. Correct. And you can't distinguish those. No. Because you don't have the holdings. Well, you do, you do we have do have holdings. Well. We, have, we have made no attempt to distinguish them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's an interesting margin to pursue, although I don't, uh, so I'm not concerned about this from a, hey, maybe uh, the strategic decision to divest is skewing our estimate of the preferences of the funds. This is not a major concern of mine. It's hard to understand why uh, the funds voting votes and all the other proposals that they do hold don't meaningfully locate them in this space. But maybe this, I'll think more about it. Maybe that, that's a bigger issue than I appreciate uh, as I stand here. But I think it, I think it's an interesting phenomenon in its own right to study, you know, the exit decision. Um, and so you should have a So it's, these are well, well taken. Uh, please, Dan. I'm right in saying that, especially across the first dimension, this is very much a Glass Lewis and ISS story. Uh, is that, as a preliminary question, then? A follow-on question. Yes. Is that? Yes. Okay. I'll say yes. Uh, <laughs> if does the data enable you then to uh, interrogate whether there are fund features that make you more of a Glass Lewis yes. voter versus an ISS yes. voter? Yes. And are there proposals where Glass Lewis voters are more likely to disagree? Yes. With Glass Lewis yes. and and or ISS than others. These are all great questions. Tables to come. Okay. So exactly. unlike the, these questions, where I don't have anything, I actually have real answers for your question. So more like that, please. No, I'm just I'm just I, I love the stuff that we get. The whole point is stuff we haven't done. So I, I'm really kidding. So 
So, yeah, right, so we, you know, we can do lots of these vote plots. This is just a new window into these proposals. Nobody's opened this kind of a window into this world. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's just interesting descriptively to think in terms of a spatial model and, and, and think in terms of people's preferences in this way. Um, so now let me um, say a little more on the interpretation of the proposals, and this is going to get to Dan, some of Dan's question. So the way principal components works is, um, so our, for each dimension, so take the first dimension, ultimately what you estimate is a vector of coefficients that are multiplied by the votes of a fund to calculate the fund's location uh, on that dimension. That's just the math. Uh, and um, this is just a histogram of the distribution of those coefficients on the first dimension. So a proposal with a positive coefficient on the first dimension uh, means that funds that vote yes on that proposal will generally get pushed uh, positively on the, in the score dimension one, and vice versa if it's uh, a negative coefficient. So we split it by whether management supported it or not, and you can see that for dimension one, um, if management opposed it, it's loading positively on dimension one, but if management supported it, it may be positive or negative. Um, this uh, so, um, is now going across those proposal categories and plotting the fraction of coefficients on proposals in that category <coughs> that are extremely positive, that's in black, that are non-extreme, that's this gray, and that are extremely negative, that's this lighter gray. Um, and so here you can see that it's you know, loading positively uh, on shareholder proposals, for the most part, although there's some negatives for proxy contests. And then for management proposals, you see it's, it's loading both negatively and positively. So um, once you then do a further breakdown, so it's the same categories here as in the previous plot, but now we're breaking it into two panels of proposals. These are proposals that I, ISS opposes, and these are proposals that ISS supports. As soon as you do that, this subgrouping organizes the coefficients, right? All the negatives are across here. Uh, sorry, all the positives are across here, with a small exception. All the negatives are across here, with ISS opposed. In other words, um, if ISS opposes the proposal, um, then it might load negatively, but it's probably not going to load positively, uh, and vice versa. This is, you know, why ISS, you know, this is the main reason uh, we interpret dimension one, in addition to the locations of ISS and management, uh, the main reason we interpret dimension one as measuring the degree to which the fund votes in line with ISS's views. What does this add compared to that, just the location of ISS is over here and lower? Um, so, da, da, da. so you could imagine a world in which um, Uh, ISS is on the lower right, but you don't organize the coefficients by conditioning on ISS's vote. Um, but I'm not sure that's right. That'd be worth checking. So, like, we could grab some random fund on the right and like do that exercise. It's a like tire kicking exercise. Uh, and you know, so uh, another way to answer your question is. Um, so principal components is this somewhat ad hoc, you know, the practice of using principal components to reduce a highly multidimensional data set to just a few dimensions is full of sort of ad hocery and judgments and so forth, like looking at this read blog and going, oh, when it becomes linear, that's when you. Um, and from reading books about this, uh, this is part of the ad hocery. So what you do is to interpret the substantive content of your component is look at the pattern of what types of coefficients load on that. This is what Poole and Rosenthal, Poole and Rosenthal do the analog of this in their big book, Ideology and Congress, uh, with a set of issues. So, you know, it's just sort of natural to follow the, the, the trying and true, rather than just declare victory or declare, you know, job done by looking at just the location. Uh, but I share your intuition. Okay, you do the same thing for uh, A2, let me cut to the chase. So the second dimension, when you subgroup by whether Glass-Lewis opposes or supports, again, it organizes the signs of the coefficients. 
So this is clearly tracking. The second dimension is clearly tracking uh, the um, uh, extent to which our mutual funds generally votes in line with Blacks Lewis's views on these proposals. Um, and you can also look at this by corporate governance proposal category. Uh, so, you know, let's go back to Dan's question. So, I, a margin where the paper I think needs to improve on is well, it's quite clear that RSS and Glass Lewis are almost definitional for what these two dimensions are. Um, that's not terribly satisfying. Like, well, what does that mean? Like, what are Glass Lewis's views uh, that are being measured on that second dimension? And what are RSS's views? And so we want to come up with a more substantive interpretation of those conceptions of corporate governance that talks about the things that, that, that those groups care about. And you know, this is another reason, Andy, that it's useful to start looking at the specific pattern of loadings across the two dimensions. So this is looking just among management, uh, sorry, just among shareholder proposals and corporate governance. And the first dimension, so this is, don't ignore this, we should just kick this out. This is a shareholder proposal to exclude abstentions from vote cabinet. There's one of them, okay? So one of the 33,000 proposals is this, but it gets a whole big bar and looks important. It's not important. But so what does uh, RSS care about? Uh, this is saying that RSS cares a bit about um, uh, shareholders' ability to act by written consent and call special meetings, which is, you know, fundamental set of rules that insulate or not uh, the board from shareholder pressure. Uh, and we do the same plot for Glass Lewis, and those classes of proposals are even more important uh, for determining your location on dimension two. Um, but as I said, this is um, we need to do more on this front. But we've done a little more than this. So let me show you the party structure stuff. So here we're back to the basic scatter plot of preferences, but we've also overlaid a density estimation, just a contour plot of the density which shows you just how many funds are packed in this, you know, big pile of things. You guys can see how high, just, you know, imagine it's coming out of the board, right? This is like a mountain. It's like a mountain, it's way over here. And there are, there's also a big mound, can we call it a mound? That's a hill, that's a mound. So the Glass Lewis Mound, the Managerialist Hill, and the ISS Mountain. Uh, so the point being that uh, preferences are not just distributed evenly across the space, rather there are three distinct clusters that we're going to analogize to political parties. Um, and we're going to define the parties as the ISS party is all funds within 30, uh, a distance of 30 from the location of ISS. Similarly, the managerialist party is within 30 of the sort of center of that cluster that we just eyeballed, very scientific. Uh, and then the Glass Lewis party is within 30 of Glass Lewis's location. Um, and we thought about making the managerialist party within 30 of management's location, but the problem is management's like over here. And also, we we're trying to characterize our mutual fund preferences, and so it doesn't make sense to center it on. Uh, it makes sense to center it on the center of the party, um, right? So, and it should, it should say managerialist party is our current working uh, name of them. So, if you look at the <coughs> fraction of total net assets in each party. Uh, about two thirds of total net assets in the fund industry is in the managerialist party. That's interesting. Like this is a window. I mean, this, the claim here is that this is a window into thinking about the structure of corporate governance that is no one's owned before. Who knew that two thirds of mutual funds were managerialist? If you accept our account of those managerialists, uh, eleven percent uh, of total net assets in the industry are in the ISS party, and five percent are in the Glass Lewis party. Um, so it's clear where the power is, right? Uh, the powers in the managerialist party. Do you have a sense of um, the percentage of uh, mutual funds, uh, families that, uh, or, or, or asset managers that uh, are clients of, of the two? It must be higher than the, those, uh, much higher than that. And I assume many in the management party are clients of the two parties. Absolutely. And so uh, we actually have data on who are clients by SS. We know every or most of the funds are fund families in our sample, whether they're clients of ISS and whether they're clients of Glass Lewis. And you're absolutely right. Uh, a bunch of managerialists are clients of both, in fact, uh, or one or the other. And ISS and Glass Lewis perform lots of services other than telling you how to vote. Um, 
including just providing information, independent recommendation. They, they give you an analysis of like the executive compensation package, how it compares to peers in the industry, and so on and so forth. Um, they also vote, right? What's that? But they also vote. They also mechanically will vote the shares, exactly. And there's like, a whole industry of you know, the plumbing here with Broadridge and ISS. So, so, so can you distinguish between which uh, services they buy from them? or? You know, we have for every family uh, a paragraph. I had an RA collect that gives like the basic way they vote, but it varies in how descriptive it is because the families vary what they tell you about their arrangements. There's no no obligation to disclose the detail, the logistics of the plumbing. Um, but back to your question. So one thing to keep in mind here is this is asset weighted. If you look at the density plot, so the ISS party is only eleven percent asset weighted. Um, and part of why that understates uh, the role of ISS or ISS's business model is ISS sells a lot of services even to these parties. But another reason it understates it is if you go back to the density estimation, so this density is not weighted by assets, it's just counting noses or counting funds, right? And, if, and the ISS party are predominantly very small funds, yeah, which would follow from a simple economy of scale situation where. Uh, you know, they'll uh, come back to, this is part of the answer question from earlier, um, if you're a huge fund family, um, when you're doing sort of make or buy decisions, sort of classic work of creation stuff, the make or buy decision, you might find it cheapest to make. That is, you're going to run your own operation and decide how to vote these shares and, and run your proxy because you're so darn big, you kind of scale to make that the cheapest way. If you're some startup, Andy Eggers decides he's going to start an investment management company, okay, as a side gig. Uh, he's probably, well, if you're not a good example, you probably would do it, but he's probably not going to approve his own uh, way of voting the shares. He's just going to get, he's going to negotiate some contract buying staff, so he's going to do it for him. Um, okay. Um, right, so query, how coherent are these parties? And, you know, if they've been generated by our preference estimation, now taking that identification of the party membership as given, you know, the model gave it to us, we ask um, what fraction of party members' votes are cast in the minority of the party. So for every proposal, define for each of the parties the majority vote of that party. We just look, we, the data tells us that you know, on any given proposal, the majority vote of the ISS party was yes, and the majority vote of the Glass party was no, and so on and so forth. Then we just count the fraction, or we count the fraction of votes in that party that were cast in the minority of the party. So if a party were very disciplined and they always voted together, this fraction of those cast in the party's minority would be zero. You with me? And I guess it can't be more than 50% mechanically. Um, so, well, you see the point. So, uh, so looking across all proposal categories and looking across all mutual funds, so 25% of mutual fund votes are cast against the majority vote among all mutual funds. Okay, so that's a nice sort of benchmark. You know, we don't need our model for that. It's just like looking across all the votes. If you look at the ISS party, only 4% of party members' votes are cast against the majority vote of the ISS party. It's a highly coherent party in terms of votes. Uh, Glass-Lewis is less, but substantially less coherent, only 8%, or as many as 8%. 8% are cast with the minority uh, of the party, and then the managerialist party is the least coherent. It's all the way up at 16%. Obviously, we could make we could drive these numbers down by just defining party membership more tightly. Recall, we chose 30 as the radius of the party. Where did 30 come from? 30 came from like looking at the scatter plot and scratching our heads and going, eh, 30. Okay, very scientific. And we thought about looking at the tolerance of it, and you know, you can play games. Uh, and you you can explore sensitivity of these, both the, the Total net assets, the party membership in terms of that net assets and in terms of party coherence. Basically, as the radius gets smaller, obviously mechanically, the net assets get smaller, okay? But then as well, almost certainly, this isn't mechanical, but it's going to be the case, the party coherence is going to go up. Because that's what this is supposed to be measuring, it's your preference. But the model would be broken if that weren't the case. So we could drive these numbers in different ways. We, we haven't really played with it yet. Um, Okay, so here's uh, another really simple way to see, this is now getting to one of Dan's questions, um, a really simple way to see how the parties differ in their voting behavior. 
So again, the model, all the model has done in the background here is told us which funds are in which party. Now like ignore the model now and just let ask for each of these proposal categories, what's the average vote among party members? And you can see that um, so the man the managed proposals are here and above. And you can see that, like, um, take the first category, managed proposals related to compensation. These are mostly say on pay votes. 83% of managerialist party members' votes in that category uh, are yes. Yeah? Um, in contrast, only 59% of ISS party votes are yes on that category. And only 46% of Glass Lewis uh, <coughs> party members' votes are yes in that category. Um, and so, you know, just as sort of a basic reality check on our account of the party structure. Uh, it better be the case that the party that we're calling the managerialist party supports management at substantially higher rates, right? And it does. Phew. Okay. Uh, certainly, on director elections, these are uncontested director elections. 83% of the managerialist party's votes are votes in favor versus only 64 and 52% of the ISS and Glass Lewis parties. Huge differences. These are not small differences. These are massive differences in voting behavior. And there's not like some fancy model. Like, well, the reason I like this window is it's like, these are literally just averages of a bunch of ones and zeros, right? It's the fraction of yes votes. There's no like complicated thing you don't understand. It's just that, it's like the average. It's the fraction of yes votes. Um, interestingly, the ISS party is substantially more supportive of shareholder proposals uh, than is the Glass-Lewis party. Um, and this is getting back to sort of how to think about substantively what it means to be these parties, not just labeling class Lewis and ISS. So among the governance proposals, the ISS party is 82% yes, versus only 70% yes. Um, on, and this is getting to ISS question, interesting distinction between how the Glass Lewis party, so you might think of the Glass Lewis party and ISS party as two distinct shareholder rights parties or something like this. Mm -hmm. And um, Interestingly, the ISS party um, is not as tough in uncontested director elections as the Glass Lewis party. So 64% versus 52%. It's actually, that's actually a big difference. Uh, Substantively. What, what explains the big difference with respect to auditor ratification? Yeah, this is a big mystery. So Glass Lewis has a bugaboo about auditors, okay? They like to be contrarians when it comes to Ernst and Young and so on and so forth. So, um, Indeed, if you read, so Glass Lewis and ISS both publish uh, like 100 page documents that summarize their policies about uh, proxy voting, how they make recommendations. And there's a whole section on how Glass Lewis you know, looks at whether the auditor, I, I can't remember off the top of my head now, the various things that trigger its poll votes. But it's got a bunch of things, and ISS like, just kind of ignores them. Um, Just out of curiosity, what proportion of auditor votes make it into your sample? Oh, tiny, tiny, tiny. Right. But there are, you know, there are every year, right. uh, and so there are numerous in the overall population of proposals. Yeah. It shocked us that any made it through our left side of this filter, because we thought of those as like, I'm And this is why, it's the last Lewis is what's driving them into our sample. One thing that would be interesting, you could can, you can do this analysis um, for the whole sample without the, uh, so, so I mean, That's a great point. That's a great point. It would just make the differences smaller, presumably, and all the numbers would go up. Yeah, that's a great uh, suggestion. Um, yeah, what it may do is shrink the differences, but that's a real thing. Um, you know, it's just two different windows. Um, you know, think of our subpopulation as these are the proposals of those at least a minimal amount of controversy. In my view, that's probably the more interesting subpopulation, just as in terms of the S demand that we're interested in. But I, we should probably do that. That's a great thought. That, that hadn't occurred to me. So let me finish with one thought I was in the middle of, which is, so the glass uh party is tougher in uncontested direct election. So recall, like, early slide about the role of shareholder voting. One of the roles is um, uh, it plays a part in shareholders efforts to monitor management, including in, in passing the poll votes and uncontested direct election when they're dissatisfied. What's interesting is, for proxy contests, it flips. ISS is far more likely to sign, or the ISS party, let me make this clear, this is our fund votes. The ISS party is far more likely to sign with the activists than the class of party. You, you know, intuitively you would think these two would go together. If you're tough 
In uncontested recollections, you're tough. In proxy that's not the case. That's a puzzle. I don't know what to make of that. And then there's, there's got to be a story, but I don't know what the story is yet. And again, I'm, forgive me for all the marketing, but yeah, you can tell what we're a little bit self. It's a weird project, okay? I appreciate it. it's a weird project. And we're still trying to figure out how to frame like why this is interesting. I'm pretty sure it's interesting, but it's a tough nugget to sort of come up with the framing. And like that little puzzle, like you wouldn't have come to, I think, without this sort of framework. Okay, but I'll stop being so defensive uh, about it. There was a question, John. I was just going to point out that you know if you look at the shareholder proposal to elect to remove the requisite flips, right? Um, and so I assess it's more work than in glass lives. No, it's consistent in the sense that, so, um, oh, yeah, okay. just to be clear, right? So these are the nominees of the dissident, right. these are the nominees of management. Right. Um, and the only reason that you might think, like, hey, why are these different at all? And that's because um, it's often the case that there's a, a well, it's complicated, but um, one reason for that is uh, there are often fewer nominees by the shareholder than by management when they want a short study, for example. And there's some other sort of wrinkles that produce it, but it's broadly consistent. Please. Could one explanation of the story that you asked be that um, activist investors, supporting activist investors, is something different than being tough and generally uncontested? Yeah, actions. that makes total sense. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and one thing we can do, this is related to the earlier question, is so we've got a data set of activist events through Shark Repellent, which is pretty comprehensive. And it's got a lot of descriptive variables about the nature of the activist event. We have yet to really mine, we've, I have, we've merged it in, it's actually sitting in the, in the big data frame, but we've actually not done anything with it yet. And um, we could suss out, perhaps, uh, the kinds of activist events that are generating Glass Lewis versus ISF support and so forth. Uh, So, also I was wondering what happens please. if you exclude certain proposals, is it then possible for example to, for example to ratify auditors, I, for me this somehow messes up the whole analysis because this is something that Glass-Lewis does but ISS doesn't, um, by eliminating that, is it possible for example to come to one party? <laughs> no, for sure no. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is the ratified auditors is a tiny, tiny fraction of the sample. 33,000 proposals <coughs> have like a couple hundred ratified auditor proposals. So it, it's just not going to do anything in any material way to change things. But uh, the more fundamental answer, and this gets to an earlier set of questions, is you know our conception of what's going on here, or what we're trying to investigate, is a theory under which there are um, a set of latent preferences um, that determine these agents' votes on a wide range of proposals. And so um, it turns out, says our results, those two latent characteristics are nicely labeled as ISS followedness, followerness, and Glass Lewis followerness. Um, but I, in general, um, I'm more inclined to estimate more dimensions, like out of third dimension, fourth dimension, on the, with the entire universe of proposals, than to sort of start cherry picking. So one of the things I like about this methodology is it's all data driven. We don't come to the data with any assumption about the structure of preference. We just hand it all the votes we have and say, you tell us, model, what's the structure of preferences. And um, so for us, the role of ISS and Glass-Lewis is a result, right? It is not an assumption. The data are saying uh, ISS and Glass-Lewis are central. That's a finding of the project. And if you start bringing external a priori assumptions, I think it, you lose some of the, the data-drivenness aspect of the project, which I consider a strength. I mean, it's got some downsides, but I consider it to a, a unique strength of the Is approach. there something underlying Glass-Lewis and ISS? I would assume yes, it's not because these funds would like to follow these. I think it's because they have ideologies who fit with these yeah. ISS, and then you would want to like eliminate idiosyncratic things like maybe Glass yeah. has something with auditors, but that doesn't really have to do anything with their general view of corporate governance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me talk about and this, is back to another question. Um, 
fun characteristics that predict party membership, that predict preference. So you just look at some basic characteristics. This is fraction of uh, the fund family that are index funds. This is the asset weighted, you know, the fraction of assets in the family that are index fund managed. And this is just the average uh, total of assets of funds in the party. You can see that the managerialist party is far more indexing, you know, far more heavily indexing, and uh, has a far larger um, fund size than the ISS and Class Lewis uh, parties. Uh, and when you put this in a regression framework, it works as well. So this is score. This is your score on the first dimension, and we're just predicting your score on the first dimension using indexing a, a family level measure of the fraction of net assets in the family that are indexed, and then a bunch of um, this is just breaking down the total net assets in the family into five quintile buckets. Um, and you see that um, indexing is highly predictive of um, being in the managerialist party, right? So score one, is you're high on score one, you're moving away from the managerialist party and into the access party. And then the score two version of it uh, is, wait, the score two version? Oh no, I cut the score two version. I didn't think I have time, but there's a score two version of this. Uh, and the score two version, in addition to having the same indexing result, it also lights up on size. And so, um, in which direction? I'm trying to remember now. So, uh, in the direction of bigger families are negative. Is that right? So, yeah. so in moving you again, the big ones are, are managerialist. And that's consistent. You keep in mind that the big picture here, which is um, forget regressions for a second. Who is it that's in these parties? Uh, are the parties? Yeah, I missed it. I went too quick. Ooh. So like, Vanguard, Black, BlackRock, State Street. These are huge fund complexes, right? Um, and they're all managerialists. <coughs> what, what's interesting? I mean, what's interesting about that um, coefficient on size? Yes. When you've got um, indexed, also in the that's right. regression. That's the line. Um, you know, where, where it's indexed. The intuition would be that you follow management because you don't really care. So you just kind of yes. you've got to vote because you've got to declare how you vote. So you kind of go through the motion. Yes. But you just follow management because you don't you don't invest anything. Yes. But if you're not indexed, then the bigger you are, the bigger the fund assets, then economically you have more interest in actually looking at what's going on. So it's interesting that those guys are in the management team. That's a great point. That's a great way to put it. Uh, to, to immediately qualify, I mean, the interesting thing about the index funds is that they don't have an outside option. I mean, they can't access it because they have to hold the index. So, in a sense, that would, at least intuitively, make them more interested in what's going on uh, because they can't get out of it. So, whereas those who do not, do not follow the index, they have an outside option they could exit. So, I think that. So Complicates it. Sorry, one second. I'm going to lose this. Expect otherwise. Um, please. Yeah, you have this part in the graph where the model got some predictions wrong, which is essentially a long if you're indifference curve. Yes, exactly. Um, so why do you see voting there at all if your model predicts that the fund should be indifferent? And if, I mean, is part of it, if you would break it down, that the funds that vote closer to that indifference line are funds that have larger holdings in that company relative to the fund size? So, take this example, okay? So this is sort of, this is the cutting line. Yeah. Um, so the cutting, so funds that are very close to the cutting line, yeah. um, the systematic part of their preference that we've estimated makes them close to indifferent. Right. But the underlying, this gets into some of the econometrics here, the underlying model is model stochastic utility, where there's a random shock as well that's at the defined at the fund proposal level, yeah. which is surely right. There are idiosyncratic factors in any given proposal fund combination that will have some effect. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the way to, within the model, the way to interpret these errors is that's just the stochastic term at work. Mm -hmm. Like it's healthy for there to be mispredictions. Like yeah. there's something wrong with running these predictions. And, um, and so, right, so why do these guys vote? The reason they vote, um, so a couple things. So first, uh, because of the stochastic, the stochastic aspect of utility, they are not, in fact, indifferent, not necessarily. 
under the, the systematic part of the utility, it's indifferent. But there may be indeed some random shock that makes them far from indifferent. A. B. They're, they vote because they're essentially obligated to vote. And they, they're obligated to set up some sort of voting system consistent with their fiduciary duties. And essentially, universally, all these big fund families have done so by creating a bunch of systems that just generate votes, right? They're going to vote. And they've got various machinery to generate that with particular policies to get come into play. But they don't, uh, in general, that machinery doesn't include, hey, we're not going to bother voting. There are actually a few fund families that have chosen strategically to stop voting because they think that's actually an interest in their investors, which I think is right, because why should they care? They should be minimizing costs. I think that's an enlightened view, but it's a tiny minority of fund families that, that do that. So, so maybe one brief follow-up question. Please. Would it also be wrong to, to say that if you included all votes that you would essentially get, so not without a filter, you would see a clustering around that line? Ah, crucially, um, the filter is at the proposal level. So for proposals that make it in, yeah. this is all the votes. Right. Um, and for the, if we brought in, so we've actually played with that filter. You can put the filter down. Mm -hmm. uh, it runs just fine at 5%. Now various things start breaking in my computer. <laughs> there really is like, some computational limits we're up against. So I have to run this all on our high performance com computing cluster at NYU or this yeah. big server with lots of processors, and then anyway, things get, it just gets unwieldy when the sample gets so big. But things work down to 5%, and I've run like 2% lopsided this <coughs> with just a one year cohort to make it manageable, and like, things get kind of noisier or something, but it's, it still works. There's nothing special at 8% that like, things hinge on. Um, so, oh, I, I, like, you, I, I know my time is out, but you, nobody has told me how to stop, so I can keep going uh, until you, yeah, you know, someone will come drag me. But let me just show you one more picture, and then I'll shut up. So recall what I promised at the beginning of the talk is we're going to create issuer level measures. Here are the issuer level measures. So the, the gray dots are the funds, once again. The pink red dot, um, we've superimposed in the same space the mean preference of the 2,500 public companies for which we were able to calculate the mean preference among their mutual fund shareholders. And it's in the same space, right? Because each of those issuer level mean preferences is just a weighted average of the fund's preferences by construction. That's all it is. So it's going to be somewhere kind of within the, um, the uh, domain of the fund preferences. And what's interesting is there's actually a lot of heterogeneity. I mean, um, issuers are different. And you can play with this issue level measure and ask whether it predicts stuff at the firm level. We just started getting this part of the project in the last week, and this is all breaking news. So I'm going to show you a result, but it's not real in the sense that it's very easy to break. Okay, but you can specify things just so. You know, this won't be how we roll in the final thing, so that our public company uh, level score means uh, score the shareholders of dimension one. Uh, predicts the issuer declassifying its port, controlling for uh, market cap. But it's not robust. You can break it by various things. So I don't know what do. We just started this. Um, but I, I think this is an interesting margin of the project. And again, it's just having, so one part of the project is, look, let's understand the structure of preferences. But another is, let's just get some measures of preferences. We don't have, nobody's had a measure of shoulder preferences before. And once you have a measure, then you can do other stuff, right? And like, we're aggressive on stuff. Uh, hopefully with plausible research designs. But I know over time. Nobody's told me, you guys are very polite. That's just, yeah, that's what's going on. Can I keep you here for hours if I just don't stop talking? Yeah. Or no, someone will pull the fire. I think we all agree that this is uh, extremely interesting. At the same time, uh, there are a couple of MLFs here in the room. Uh, there's also, of course, a commercial application of potential one of uh, this uh, uh, take the model on uh, predict votings and voting outcomes and bet on them, basically. But uh, make sure you liaise with uh, mm -hmm. the media mm -hmm. and the uh, line before you venture on that uh, <laughs> sort of application. Thank you very much for Thank coming you. over. Thank you.